All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 5th of November, Saturday, in the year of our Lord, 2022. And somebody left a comment on my video. It appeared, uh, on a video, it appeared yesterday, I believe it was, an alert. Uh, it was from uh, uh, Rumble. <laughs> I often try to post him to both YouTube and Rumble. Gotta have some comp YouTube's gotta have comp uh, competition. See, if you don't have competition, you can abuse people. If you got competition, they can go someplace else. So, yes, uh, I'm all in favor of places like uh, Rumble, Odyssey. I haven't uploaded to Odyssey because, well, it is a bit odd over there. Um, it's definitely free speech. Maybe a little bit too free. Uh, you can say whatever you want in Odyssey, I think. And a lot of the stuff that's said over there is simply bad. There's a problem with social media in general is that the, you're isolated. You're not real. You're not, it's see, so you can, uh, it's like the Ku Klux Klan wearing a mask, you know, so if nobody can really tell who you are for sure. Well, they can if they want to look hard enough, but. Maybe. There's ways around that, by the way. You know, like forging IP addresses. You can do it. It's not hard to do. You can do it. Uh, obviously, the government can fake everything. The whole government is fake. They're not working for it. See, democracy is a lie. Representative democracy is a lie. America is a failed experiment. It's just true. I mean, just... just it's, they've outed themselves now, right? COVID, especially. Donald Trump. Donald Trump outed the mafia that controls Washington. Um, the criminal organization that actually runs things and, be, and behest of their masters. What do I mean by that? Remember when Nancy Pelosi, after the January 6th thing, uh, put razor wire National Guard all around uh, the Capitol building? Why did she do that? Because she was afraid. They were all afraid. They were afraid of you, the American citizens, the voters. They were afraid of you. That's why That's why there was such a backlash. I think Antifa, by the way, is actually a, is, if it's not directly controlled by the deep state, it definitely is indirectly controlled by the deep state. Now, things like Antifa are incredibly easy to manipulate, especially using social media. If, you, if people use social media to communicate, you don't know who's talking to you or who's suggesting you do things. You know, it's very convenient what was going on. But uh, Donald Trump, why was there such a vis uh, visceral reaction to Donald Trump? Was it because he was... Now, he could have run like a, as a Democrat. Would have been a problem. Or Republican. I mean, the, the, the issue... Donald Trump was an outsider, and he campaigned against the deep state, the swamp. So the swamp had to defend itself. The, the criminal organization that controls Washington had to defend itself against an outsider that thought that they should actually be serving you rather than themselves and their masters. And But all these things that, that came up, see, Donald Trump was such a threat to the establishment, both Democrats and Republicans, that they did everything they could to get rid of him. That that was a problem right there. Donald Trump was a populist. In other words, he he wanted to represent you. 
Uh, that's why there's a picture of Andrew Jackson. There was a picture of Andrew Jackson. Hey, could somebody at the White House basically, you know, if you're not really happy with, with uh, senile Joe, just slip Andrew Jackson's picture back up in the in the Oval Office. I don't know who's up there now. Probably Joe Biden, a picture of himself. Remember, remember who's who's sitting there. Ah, uh, but no, uh, Trump was a threat. I had to get rid of him because he was a populist. He was a populist, and the idea. See that the people in government, both Democrats and Republicans, the establishment. The deep state is, you are a threat to them because they don't serve you and they know it. They serve themselves. That was the problem. All right. Uh, over the uh, on Rumble, that was a rabbit trail, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, here, uh, Rumble. You know, I, I really don't know how to use Rumble. Is there something I don't like about Rumble? is basically if you want your videos to be indexed so people can find them, they end up being monetized. I could care less. Uh, the money's just going to sit there until it rots, which will not be for long anyway. Uh, anyway, here is uh, the verdict is in on the Church of the Nazarene. This is what I want, want to do this video about, really. There was a comment on Rumble. I had to go to Rumble to find it because I was thinking, well, I didn't see it on YouTube. D. Josephine, two days ago, said, You're misinformed. Well, what? Uh, the Church of the Nazarene and the Atonement, the Nazarene denomination is not biblical, evangelical, and Protestant. They're not. They're not. They're, they're no more evangelical, biblical, and Protestants than Jehovah's Witnesses. Because they're wrong on the central thing. And that's what's important. So D. Josephine, two days ago, said, You're misinformed about the Church of the Nazarene? In which way? Why? Because... Wait a minute, I'm misinformed? I'm probably more informed than 99 point, 99%, let's just be conservative, 99% of Nazarenes. I'm misinformed? I mean, I knew Nazarenes well. I've got a copy of the, uh, the 1997 to 2001 manual right here in my hand. And it's basically the same thing that's out there today. That's uninformed? Just like saying I'm uninformed about the Westminster Confession of Faith. No, I'm not in, uninformed at all. I know more about that than 99% of Presbyterians. Because 99% probably haven't read it. Or thought about it. Or studied it. So, I, I've got the hand. All this says is, uh, we believe that Christ died for our sins. Big deal. What does that mean? I thought it meant what it always means to Bible-believing, evangelical, Protestant, fundamentalist Christians. That Christ died for our sins in our place, paying our penalty. Turns out, Nazarenes don't officially believe that. Now, you're allowed to believe that if you're Nazarene. And some Nazarenes, like Professor Greider, lament the fact that too many Nazarenes believe that. But not because they're Nazarenes. The interesting thing is, Greider and the others here, uh, ignore the fact that Wesley believed that. Well, they're pretty. I think he does acknowledge that. But uh, John Wesley actually believed in penal substitutionary atonement, just like everybody did. But not these people. Greider doesn't. Greider is vociferously hostile toward that doctrine. He calls it Calvinist. No, no, it's Christian. See, she just slanders it uh, as if Calvinists only, only Calvinists believe that. Well, probably the largest Calvinist denomination, <laughs> the largest Presbyterian do denomination in the United States, PCUSA, probably doesn't believe that. <laughs> Whatever they are. Well, they have a Presbyterian form of government. I guess that's good enough because that's all they got. Okay, so uh, I, not only Greider, but I, was, I, I heard from the Nazarene pastor at the church I've been attending, well, that's not really the, uh, the official uh, Nazarene theology. So I, I got on eBay and I ordered, no, Amazon, ordered the official 
more or less officially by by Orton H or what is it? H. Orton Wiley. Three volume set. So I'm uninformed about what the Nazarene ch No, uh ma'am, I think D. Josephine. I am assume that's I think I'm much more informed than you are. Now, uh, the church you attend, or whatever, or you personally may believe in penal substitutionary atonement, as I acknowledge, there are many Nazarenes, as Grider laments, that actually believe in that, but not the majority. And the denomination does not officially hold to that. It doesn't. In fact, they are so indifferent to the cross, they don't have an official position, other than what they teach in their seminaries, which is anti-cross, anti-Christ, the, the 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 purpose for the, now my house is old, as old as the Nazarene denomination, it was formed up here in Chicago, uh, in the last century, beginning of the last century. So, my grandfather was older than the Church of the Nazarene, so that tells you how true that church is. See, it, and it was just a movement. Uh, to promote one of John Wesley's aberrant doctrines, the doctrine of sinless perfectionism. That's the whole reason for the Nazarenes. They were, they were Methodists that didn't like the de-emphasis of Wesley's oddities. On biblical myth is all that doctrine is, just like the... Uh, Pentecostals speaking in tongues. What they do is not speaking in tongues at all. I challenge anyone to prove that they speak in what the Bible talks about is tongues, which are, the word tongues is simply language. You must prove it's a language. And at Pentecost, they spoke in known languages, languages known to the people there in Jerusalem, gathered from all over the, Jews gathered from all over the uh, the, the Mediterranean world of that time. Prove it. If you can't prove it, it's nothing but a myth. You just take it as an article of faith, just like the, the second work of grace of, of sinless perfectionism or entire sanctification. If you look up, and the reason I bought Grider's book originally is I was wondering where, what is the biblical evidence? Have I missed something? Not at all. Two verses in First Thessalonians, which talks about the but that's a book that talks about the rapture, right? Oh, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's probably in the Latin Bible. Because it's a derivative uh, the word we get uh rape from and rapture is it means to snatch away. So yeah, to 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 snatch a woman, for example. That, that's where that word comes from. It comes from the Latin. So I, I suppose if I looked in the Vulgate, I'd probably find it, but I really don't care. So when people say that, well, the word's not in the Bible, that's, they're just foolish. They're, they're demonstrating their ignorance. They're simply ignorant of the Scriptures. Uh, it's just like sometimes you run into people that, that say, well, such and such author didn't actually say this thing. They said something like it. Well, first of all, they're probably looking at an English translation and assuming that the original author spoke English. Yeah, Luther, Luther. Uh, he made some quote one time about, uh, about uh, the battle. If you're not actually contending where the Satan is contending against the church, you're not actually uh, preaching the gospel or something like that. Anyway, it was a... Uh, this, people looked, they couldn't find any English source for it. Well, Luther spoke uh, Middle German, I think. And Latin. Uh, translations aren't the same thing. Anyway, the uh, so I don't think I'm misinformed at all. Uh, I think the problem is the uh, the people that go to the Church of the Nazarene are not informed. And part of the reason for that is their uh, their denomination is simply indifferent to the cross. I'll ask you, uh, you can decide which is worse, hostility toward the cross or indifference. 
Remember what Jesus said in the book of Revelations to the church of Laodicea? Uh, I would that you be hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm coffee. It's not good for anything. No, it's just... <laughs> that's what microwaves are for. Reheat, reheat. Uh, anyway, the, but the, the issue is the cross. And as I thought about that comment a little bit, or, uh, the reason I'm... The reason is barely <laughs> November 5th is because I was I awoke and I was thinking about that. I was thinking... You know, we talk about the fundamentals of the faith. The cross is the fundamental. It is the fundamental of the faith. That Jesus died on that cross a vicarious death, a substitutionary death, paying our penalty, the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. He died in our place. An innocent man died in our place. Paying for our sin. And proved it by rising from the dead. See, all the other fundamentals of the faith, you know, you talk about, the fundamentalists talk about the, the, uh, the, the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, and they'll fuss about inerrancy versus infallibility. Well, it's, it's a difference that has no content in the words. I would say infallibility is a much stronger term than inerrancy, you silly people. Because you can have something that, that is inerrant but fallible. Because it could be uh, an in, in, in inerrant transcript. An errant transcript? The question is, is the teaching of the Scripture infallible? That's much more important than whether the, the words are inerrant, verbally inerrant. That's not the issue. Is it true? Is it truth? That's the issue. You want to fight about words, you're missing the point. Uh, <clears throat> it's infallible and inerrant. How about that? But that's, so what? So what? I mean, that believing that doctrine does not save you. In fact, you could not believe that doctrine and be saved. It's not very consistent, but... See, you could believe there's errors in the Bible and, and believe the gospel. I wouldn't recommend, if, if you are saved, why would you do that? Obviously, you're listening to man rather than God. So the Bible doesn't say that about itself. So, I mean, if you're a born-again Christian, you're going to believe the Bible. If you choose to believe jo uh, uh, Charles Darwin instead, well, that demonstrates you're a worshiper of Charles Darwin in the world. Yes, I am a young six-day creationist because that's what the Bible says. And I'm well aware yom can be used for more than literal, just like uh, the uh, English word day can be used for a period of time too. However, that it almost always means a literal day. And when uh, God emphasized by, and it was evening and it was morning, the sixth day, why did he say that if he meant, why cannot God simply say there was ages of time and then I did this, and then there was ages of time and I did that? The Hebrew is perfectly able to say that. So why, so basically, you know, if you, if you try to be a long day creationist, uh, there's something shaping your thinking other than the Scripture. That's the point. Now, the cross, see, biblical inerrancy is, is not the, the central fundamental of the faith. The virgin birth of Christ is not the central fundamental of the faith. Now, you'd have a real hard time actually believing in Christ and then denying any of these things. But that's not the point. Believing in the virgin birth itself does not save you. It's 
Jesus being born of a virgin is not the gospel itself. It supports the gospel. Just like the infallibility of Scripture supports the gospel. Jesus' miracles is not the gospel. It supports the gospel. It tells us who he is, among other things. It's like the virgin birth. It tells us who he is. But it's, it, in itself, that doctrine, is, is, although is a fundamental, because without it, things are pretty twisted, it is not the gospel itself. It is not the fundamental of the faith. The resurrection, the resurrection, if that is true, does, are you saved simply by believing that Christ rose from the dead? No. No. Uh, people, you can conjure up a text, a, a verse to say that. However, without the fundamental, the resurrection doesn't mean anything. The resurrection itself is not a saving doctrine. Say, even though it's a necessary doctrine, it's not in itself, it is not the gospel. His ascension to the heaven is, is not the gospel. His, his return is not the gospel itself. The gospel of Jesus Christ and the fundamental of the faith, which all these others support, is the fact that Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, God incarnate in human flesh, died on a cross for our sins, laid down his life in a horrible manner, paying our penalty because the wages of sin is death. Cut off from God in order to reconcile us to God, God had to pay the penalty of our sin. And people don't like that. They think, well, God can just forgive. God is love. God can just forgive. Well, their God is not the God of the Bible. Jesus, remember, in the garden said, if there is another way, he knew what he was facing. He said, Father, if there be some other way, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He came to do the will of his Father. There was no other way. But I've noticed that Nazarene theologians really don't care what the Bible says, which is true about most theologians. They really don't care what the Bible says. Otherwise, they wouldn't, you know, if they actually believe the Bible is the Word of God, fully authoritative, fully sufficient, why would they write volumes of theology? Huh? <laughs> they need something to do, I guess. But, no, they're, all their books, all this is just the opinion of a man. That they, they, prom they promulgate it. In, see, seminaries are evil. Because rather than simply teaching the scripture, they teach man's opinions. That's all this book is, is a three-volume set of man's opinions. One man. That's all it is. Of course, he quotes many other men in here, and they're all just their opinions. So they don't even have so much of their own opinion. So they lean on other opinions, too, because they can't lean on the scripture. And when they do, they terribly distort it sometimes, like the Nazarene doctrine of uh, sinless perfectionism. Two verses that say absolutely nothing of what they say. Talks about our entire sanctification at the return of the Lord Jesus. First Thessalonians, that's it. That's it. They, can't, they couldn't even read the entire verse. They weren't looking to read the Bible. They were looking to justify their own mythology, their own false doctrine that was started by Wesley. Nobody before Wesley believed that nonsense. Just like dispensationalism. Before, before Darby and Schofield, nobody believed that nonsense. Even Wesley said, if it's new, it's not true. 
because it's not part of the, the faith delivered once for all in the saints. Well, why didn't Wesley apply his own dictum to himself and his nonsense? Inconsistency. We're inconsistent. Sin. sin. It was sinful. He promulgated a false doctrine. That's sinful. A false doctrine about sinless perfectionism. Uh, it doesn't work. Anyway, I beg to differ. I am very well informed. The cross is the fundamental of the faith. The, the penal substitutionary atonement that Christ paid the penalty for our sins. What did God say to Adam? The day you eat of that tree, you will die. And he did. He was cut off from God and began to physically die. But he was spiritually dead already. He didn't have that relationship with God anymore. And we come into the world dead in trespasses and sins, in Adam's sin too, because we do not come into this world born into that relationship with God. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. But in order for that to be possible, in order for, for, for us to be reconciled with God and restored to that relationship, our sin must be taken care of in order that God might be both just, not simply ignoring our evil, and the one who justifies, pronounces as just, those who believe in Jesus Christ. Without the penal substitutionary atonement, there is no gospel. That is the gospel. Jesus and what he did on the cross is the fundamental of the faith. The authority of scriptures, the virgin birth, uh, the, the you know, prophecies about Christ's coming, his miracles, and his resurrection and his ascension and his coming again all support that. They are all connected intimately with Jesus and what he did on the cross. He came to die on that cross. If he hadn't risen again, that would prove that he wasn't who he was. See, the resurrection is a proof of who Jesus is. And what he accomplished on the cross is our salvation. That is the fundamental. Anything else is not Christianity. It's not. So when you have a denomination of any kind that even minimizes the cross, Rick Warren. Now, see, people like Rick Warren, uh, they will have... In, they'll, in their filing cabinet, they will have a statement of faith. That, yeah, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. I believe the, the 2001 Baptist faith and message. I believe that. But it doesn't influence what they do. It's not really the fundamental of the faith to them at all. It's just, it's just like, you know, Nazarenes, you can believe that. You can believe penal substitutionary atonement if you want. Just don't expect it to be taught in the church. Just don't expect it to be taught in the seminaries. See, Nazarenes are indifferent to the cross. I mean, you can't you can't believe in the governmental theory of the atonement and, and take the cross seriously. It's just nonsense. It just it doesn't fit in anything. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Because they don't like it. So you read these theologians, and they, they worship a God who can arbitrarily forgive. God can just, God commands us to forgive our enemies, so he must do the same thing. Just, and they, reje they reject, they say, if there's a penalty paid, then it's not really forgiveness. That's a, who pays the penalty? These people are sub-Christian. Definitely sub-Christian. You know, I was deceived. How many other Nazarenes are deceived? Probably most of them. See, this is not a doctrine. This is really a, a problem with the Nazarenes, too, because, because the cross is de-emphasized, just like Rick Warren's church and Bill Hybel's church, all these other box churches, because it's not about Christ and Christ crucified. It's about something else. Let's go over to the Scripture. Let us go over to the Scripture uh, because that's more important than what I have to say, isn't it? Uh, okay, let me 
Where is my window? It's hiding. I mean, okay, there it is. <sighs> First Corinthians, chapter 1, starting at verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, that's philosophy, by the way, uh, did not come to know God, philosophia, love of wisdom. So the world through its wisdom, through philosophy, through Aristotle, through Plato, through uh, the rest of them, did not come to know Marx, uh, you know, none of them. Nietzsche, none of them came to know God. The world through its wisdom did not come to know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached, not the foolishness of preaching. That That's a poor translation of the King James at that particular point. The foolishness of the message preached is the preaching of a particular thing, not preaching in general. To save, to save, to save those who believe. Preaching what? Virgin, Christ being virgin born? Uh, the Bible being literally true? Um, Christ coming in judgment? <laughs> That's not the gospel. To save. The good news is to save those who believe. The Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, yeah, because it's whoever hangs on a tree is cursed of God. Christ was cursed for us. And to the Greeks, foolishness. This, this is nothing. <laughs> Excuse me. Don't worry, COVID's not infective over the internet. Am I saying I have COVID? No, I'm not. Am I saying I don't have it? No, I'm not. Who knows? Who knows? I, I, I would almost like to do... Let me... This distraction. I'm almost tempted to go to Walmart and buy one of those home test kits and apply it to the air conditioner or the uh, the filter on my car, on my minivan, and see if it has COVID. Because there's a good chance it might. It's just like if you've got a twenty dollar bill, uh, uh, there's a good chance that 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 there might be traces of cocaine on that bill. <laughs> good chance. Very small traces, but good chance. Uh, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, called by God, unless God calls you, you're not going to be saved. Both Jews and Greeks, unless you hear the gospel, you're not going to be saved. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. If, if they're preaching something, some gospel other than Christ crucified, it's not the gospel. Christ crucified for your sins. It's not the gospel. The atonement, it's not the gospel. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay, let's go to another scripture. First Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, see, there were some preaching in Corinth that the dead aren't raised because they were influenced by philosophy. And uh, uh, the ideas of some of the uh, uh, philosophical cults that physical things uh, is evil and spiritual is good. So there could not be a physical resurrection because that would be, the salvation is to be free from your physical body. For them, that's in their system. One of the many false religions of this world. Uh, well, Buddhism's that way too. So is Hinduism, but it's particularly Buddhism.
even more so, because annihilation is salvation in Buddhism, apparently. So if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, see, the resurrection is the fundamental of faith, but why? Because what he did on the cross, it is the evidence given to all men of what Christ did on the cross, that he did atone for our sins. I don't know how people can avoid that and actually read the Bible. Obviously, they don't care about the Bible. Because that's what it clearly teaches. All through it. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Because Christ is the evidence that he actually did atone. But that implies that our sins were imputed to him. Our sins were laid upon him. Otherwise, the resurrection doesn't mean anything. Other than a man rose from the dead. Well, so did Lazarus. Elijah did not actually die physically. Um, Enoch was caught up without seeing death. So why not worship Enoch? Because Enoch didn't do anything for your sins. See, no penal substitutionary atonement, the entire Bible makes no sense at all. It's just, and it fits in perfectly with people like Rick Warren and others because the Bible's not central to their ministry anyway. What, but what's the Bible about? What God has done for us. It's about God's salvation, our sin and God's salvation. Our fall and God's salvation. What do you think it is? A book of auto mechanics? How do you have your best life now? Go worship Joel Osteen. You might be able to find a seat in his church. that's what you want, go to it. You'll regret it in eternity, but your choice. If Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty, vain. It doesn't mean anything. You can believe all about Christ, but if Christ has not actually died for your sins and rose from the dead, it's nothing. Just one of the 330 million Hindu deities. Uh, he's reckoned among them, too. <sighs> yes, and we are also found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised Christ, raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if there's no resurrection. If, in fact, the dead are not raised. For, if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Remember that there was teaching that there was no resurrection. Corinth was a bad church. But, not, a, you know, I guess I've been going to a bad church. Not anymore. No, no, the church doesn't preach. I, now, there are churches that I will not go to. But it's not because they do not believe in penal substitutionary atonement. It's just because I can't stand them. <laughs> I cannot stand a preacher that does not stick in the scriptures, that goes up there and preaches out of some other man book. But but I know, like that, that particular one I'm ta thinking about, I know he's theologically sound. It's just that what he does in the pulpit it sucks. And I've told him so. Privately and loudly. Made sure I made the point. Because it's wrong. It's simply wrong. You're not there to serve yourself and your interests or serve your congregation. You're there to serve God, first of all. If you're not doing that, go sell cars or sell insurance or become a senator or something useless because the preacher is more important than the president of the United States 
you serve somebody much more important than that, those people in Washington, whoever they serve. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sin. See, you can't get away from penal substitutionary atonement. And the fact that you've got professors. Now, these theology books span about the entire duration of the so-called Church of the Nazarene, which I said is no older than my house. Let's see, when was this one? Uh, this is the three-volume set. Is So, well, this was the, you know, in the 20th century. Well, the, the, the Church of the Nazarene doesn't go back farther than the 20th century. Where is the copyright date? Nineteen forty. That's 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 like within thirty years of its founding. These people were all Methodists. That's what the Church of the Nazarene. It's a Methodist break off. That's all it is. They went liberal, so rather than rather than the Methodists went liberal, uh, not that liberal back then though, and rather than, uh, but the the Nazarenes weren't about Orthodox Christianity; they were about aberrant Christianity, entire sanctification. That was their entire reason for being. That doctrine of Wesley. Pentecostalism, doctrine of the the evidence of speaking in tongues as proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I guess if you don't actually speak a real language, you don't have the Holy Spirit then, right? Because that's what they actually believe, too, some of them. Uh, UPC, uh, United Pentecostal, they, they're oneness. <laughs> By the way, the penal substitutionary atonement doesn't work with oneness either. Doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. there's no logical consistency there at all. I mean, if God does it, it's not just mumbo-jumbo. It should make some kind of sense. I mean, because God makes sense. He's not senile. Then also, verse 18, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. See, if Christ has not risen from the dead, if he didn't die for your sins and rise from the dead... You're, you're, the dead are dead, period. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, Joel Osteen, we are of all men most pitiable. All these prosperity teachers. Pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits, the beginnings of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits, the beginning of the harvest. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For in, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom uh, to God the Father. See, there's a millennium kingdom in between there, and that's necessary too. When he puts uh, an end to all rule and all authority and power, he must reign until he's put all enemies on under his feet, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Christ must reign in the millennium kingdom until he's put everything under his feet. And then he delivers up the whole shebang, restored, all the damage Satan did, undone, restored to what it's supposed to be in the will of God, delivers it all up to the Father. <sighs> Just read the Bible. But Christ crucified, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, 
born of a virgin, sinless, spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, died a sacrificial, atoning, vicarious, propitiatory, penal substitutionary death on that cross for the sins of the world, in particularly, especially for the sins of believers. Because if you don't believe, if you're not in Christ, it really doesn't do you much good. Not you particularly. Without faith, there is no salvation. Faith in Christ, but the Christ who died for your sins and rose again. Not just some generic Christ, not just some Muslim Christ, not the Hindu Christ, not the Jehovah's Witness Christ, and apparently not the Nazarene Christ. Because it's they have such a low view of the cross that they really don't care what you believe about it. It's not their central thing. But the cross is the central thing to the church of Jesus Christ. Christ and Christ crucified. And Christ risen from the dead. You know, the virgin birth, all that, all support that because it's all of who Christ is tells us that and tells us about what he did and the evidence for that, which is the resurrection. 500 some eyewitnesses. No, D. Josephine, I'm not misinformed. I think you are. Uh, and everybody out there, the cross, Christ crucified for your sins. If you hold to some, if you deny penal substitutionary atonement, the, there, there's a lot of, the other things are not false so much, but it is not the central point. And people hate that central point. They just despise it. They just despise it. Much more than the, like the, the inerrancy of Scripture. No. Much more than the virgin birth. Much more than the resurrection. They hate penal substitutionary atonement. The web is full of people that just despise it because they think God's not like that. God, God is not just. Uh, as uh, Let's see who was that. Grider in his theology book, he says God is not inherently just in his nature. See, God, his God, the God of Grider, who was a lifelong professor among the Nazarenes, his God was not the God of the Bible. He believed in a holy God, but not a just God. So what is holiness then? Nonsense. See, Grider is just full of nonsense. But when you deny the cross, you put yourself under the judgment of God. You're teaching other people falsehoods. You're teaching them a false gospel. Anathema. What will you do? What will Grider, well, Grider's dead now. Does he have eternal life? Not if he didn't believe in the, in the substitutionary atonement. He did, no, see, it's not just it's not ignorance. See, we're not talking about ignorance here. Like a young child, they might not uh, even, but even a young child can understand the con, uh, the concept of penal substitutionary atonement. It's not a hard concept. It's just one people don't like especially adults, just don't like it. In fact, they hate it. Like Grider, his, his attitude toward it was just vociferous, hostile. Well, I bet he got a surprise. Don't you get the same surprise. Christ dying for our sins bearing our sins, paying the penalty for our sins, and then rising again. That is the gospel. And that we're saved by, because of that, because of Christ and what he did, through faith in him and through faith alone. That is the gospel. Period. Add to that, and you're adding 
to what God has said the gospel is. 